2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. Let's take our reading from there. Therefore, Peter says, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such a declaration as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this declaration made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. We're here to behold our God. And the YFR organizers have asked us to begin with beholding the man who is God, Jesus. Now, if we say that Jesus is God, and if we're a Christian, that's a fundamental statement that we have to hold to and declare as truth. And we hold it really, and I hope everybody does, and we're going to go through this tonight to make sure that everybody does have it. If we are saying that Jesus is God, then Jesus is unignorable. He can't be ignored by anybody, not least by those of us who say that we are Christians or Christ followers. How easy it is, though, for things to come in and to get in the way of us ignoring or us paying attention to Jesus. Through our day, we can ignore him. Now, I'm fairly certain that there are people in this room who are not believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, born again to the new life that Jesus came to give us. So Jesus is unignorable. You cannot ignore him. He is God, and we're going to see that from Scripture tonight. Why this is important for you, if you're not yet certain as an unbeliever, is what Jesus himself said in John 6 and verse 40, when he said, This is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. You need to see him. And in seeing him, you need to believe all that he is so that you might have eternal life. And Jesus said, those who believe in him do not come under judgment, but have passed out of death to life. Let me just pause for a moment. If you are not yet certain as to who Jesus really is, and you've not put your faith and your trust in him for this life and for eternity, then you are dead. And you need to ask God tonight to open your eyes that you would see who Jesus really is. And in seeing Jesus for who he really is, that you would put your trust in him. Ask God to give you that capacity tonight. And you will pass out of death and into life. And you will have the life that is eternal. Jesus is unignorable then for those of us that are believers already. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. He says, and we all with unveiled faces, looking as in a mirror, and he's talking about the word of God as if it reflects who God is to us and us. We see a reflection of ourselves too in it. Looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Do you get it? When we look day after day at who Jesus really is in the Bible, that is the greatest gift that you possess, material gift in your hand. When you look at Jesus and you've put your trust and your faith in him, his example and the spirit indwelling you that has come from God because you have put your faith and your trust in him and you have new life. Your life has started with him and your life is to be transformed that you might become more like him from one degree of glory to another. That we would share the glory of God. Peter writes about it and he says we have become partakers of the divine nature. We don't become God, but we share in the glory of God as those who are born again into God's family. And therefore we're to grow up and to be more like Jesus every day. 
We can't ignore Jesus. None of us can. Everybody in this room must be hold. This is my son, Jesus. What we've read here, Peter is one of the apostles, the sent ones by Jesus. After Jesus had spent time with them, training them, showing them his miracles, letting them hear his teaching, they witnessed his crucifixion, they saw him buried in a tomb, they saw him raised to life, and they saw him ascend back into heaven. And they witnessed the coming of the Holy Spirit, and that compelled them to go and do what Jesus had commanded. The apostles were the sent ones who had been eyewitnesses of all that Jesus was and is. And here he says, my life is almost over. And it's really no difficulty for me to keep reminding you of the things that you already know. I'm hoping that what we're going to speak about tonight you already know, but it might be new to you. But even if you do already know it, don't switch off and go for a sleep. Not yet anyway. Peter was so concerned that people would be reminded and reminded and reminded of the truth about who Jesus is because it was so central to absolutely everything for their lives here and now and their hope for the life that is to come. You know, it was probably only maybe 25 years after Jesus had lived and died and been raised and had gone back to the glory when Peter was writing this letter. It might even have been a bit earlier. Let's say two decades. And the churches of God, the early churches of disciples of the Lord Jesus, were already hearing people saying, Jesus, um, he wasn't really God. He was really just a special man who was appointed by God to do something wonderful. That was one option that people were hearing. And that was coming at them. And the apostles were doing their best and writing their letters and going around preaching and saying, no, it's not that. There was another option. Others were saying that Jesus was God, but he only seemed to be human. So he wasn't really a man. Maybe we could go with that. No, you can't. Others were saying that he was something of God that sort of connected himself with the historic person, Jesus. And again, that was subtly undoing the reality of who Jesus really is. And others, yeah, there were more than four options even. People were saying that while Christ might have been God, he actually emptied himself of being fully God so that he might become a man. Do any of you believe any of that? Maybe you do. And if you do, listen to what Peter says. Because you need to be sorted out. Just say it to you straight. We need to be absolutely convinced that Jesus is one person with two natures that coexist in perfect unity. This is fundamental for our faith. And we'll see why towards the end of this talk. Now, it's such a difficult concept, isn't it, to get our minds around one person with two natures? What's that all about? We'll say more in a minute. And because it was so difficult a concept for people to get around their, their minds around it, that's why other ideas started to come in. And guys, this teaching is alive and kicking out there. And it's even taught by some of the churches of the music that you will listen to on YouTube and Spotify or whatever streaming service you use. They teach one of those four and undermine the true reality that Jesus Christ is truly man and truly God. Two natures in one person coexisting. Jesus is no myth either. Let's not any of us ever get into this idea that maybe it's some sort of myth that's hung around for a couple of thousand years. And it's actually quite a handy thing. I've grown up in church and it's been, it's been good to have this and it helps me through life and it makes me look good to my family and to people and so on. Guys, let's get rid of all of that. Jesus is no myth. He is the eternal Son of God. He became a man that he might save you and me. That's what Jesus came to do. Peter says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And we heard the voice from the majestic glory saying, this is my beloved son, whom I love. He was absolutely convinced that this man Jesus, that he went around preaching about and would give his life up for, was none other than God, who had eternally existed, who came, that he might become a man, so that he might bring about God's purposes of grace and love to save us sinners from a mess we could never save ourselves from. God came to us and he came in a way that we could understand him 
and in a way that was necessary so that God could deal with our sin. Let's read about the mountaintop experience. Go to Matthew 17. I do commend to Peter 1 verses 12 onwards for you to read again. We don't have time at the time. I would love to spend in it um, to draw out all the points. You notice Peter mentions the truth of all of this. Don't lose it. This is vital for our lives. If you're an unbeliever, it's vital that you know it and you believe it for life. And if you are a believer, it's vital that you don't ever let anything come in that would undermine the reality of who Jesus is. Let's read the encounter that is glorious on a high mountain. Matthew 17, verse 1. Six days later, historical reality, six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Peter responded and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you want, I will make three tabernacles or little tents here, one for you. One for Moses and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up and do not be afraid. And raising their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. When they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them saying, tell the vision to no one until the son of man has risen from the dead. It was about a week earlier that Jesus had asked the disciples, who do people say I am? And after the various options were given back by the disciples, he said to them, who do you say I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Good on you, Peter. He'd come to understand that Christ or Messiah, Christ is the Greek word for Messiah, the Hebrew word, same thing, it's a title. He says, you're the Christ. You're the one that God has promised, the anointed one who's going to come and do wonderful things. You're the son of God. And Jesus said to Peter, Peter, that's, that's wonderful, you've got that. You didn't get it yourself, it was my father in heaven who revealed that to you. That's why when I said earlier, if you're not absolutely convinced about who Jesus is, you need to ask God to help you to see him and to believe in him. Because Peter couldn't get there on his own, with his own intellect. He needed God the Father to open his eyes to see something of who Jesus was. Now what did they understand the Christ or the Messiah to be though? I think Peter, with the other disciples, was just coming stage by stage to an understanding of who Jesus was. But they hadn't got to the point where they believed that he was God. But, but it just, he said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Let me just say something here on this. The Jews were looking for this Messiah figure, the Christ, to come. The one that God had said he would send, who would be a great king over Israel, in fact, over all of the world, and rule from Jerusalem. And he would do remarkable things, described as my servant. I'll put my spirit on him. He'll do glorious things. He'll be a wonderful one. He'll be the king. And he'll be a king in the line of succession from King David. And God had made a promise to King David one of your descendants is always going to sit on the throne of Israel. And I'll be a father to him and he'll be a son to me. And then you turn to Psalm 2. And Psalm 2 has similar language when it speaks about the one that God has installed as king on Mount Zion, which was the mountain on which Jerusalem sat. This is my son. So they thought that the king, who was a descendant of David sitting on the throne, was the son of God. That's what Jews understood by that term at this time. Now we come to the Bible knowing that, well, Jesus is God the Son, yes. But for Jews, this was a tough thing. Because every day if they were a faithful Jew, they would, they would recite the Shema, you know, Deuteronomy 6, verses four and five. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Yeah, they thought that God, and they knew that God was one God. So to conceive of somebody, a man standing and being God, was entirely foreign to them, didn't even cross their mind. They thought Christ, the Christ, was going to be a wonderfully empowered, spirit-led man who would bring about God's purposes. But what the Lord Jesus was doing for Peter and for us, if we take our time through the Gospels, he's gradually opening our eyes, unveiling the glory of who Jesus really is. 
And this brings us to the reality that the glory that shone out from Jesus that day was a glimpse, an unveiling of something that meant that he was far more than just an ordinary man. And Peter and the other two, I don't think really got it. And they didn't get it till resurrection day. And then it all clicked. All the pieces came together. But up to that point, it hadn't. But here you have them and they're looking and they're wondering. You know, this brings us to the concept of the Trinity. You were hoping for an easy opening tonight, weren't you? We need to get this nailed down because this is vital. Honestly, I don't hear teaching on this in our churches very often. So I'm not trying to correct that in one session tonight, but I'm just making a point. The Trinity, the reality that God is one, but yet is revealed in the scriptures in an obscure way in the Old Testament, but plain and clear in the New Testament. He is one God, but he is three persons. Distinct, Father, Son, and Spirit, yet one God. Each of those persons is fully God and has all the attributes of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, but yet not one of them on their own is a God. So it's not three gods, it's one God in three persons. Mind blown? Yeah. This is something we take by faith. Thomas Watson, 17th century Puritan uh, from England said this, our narrow thoughts can no more comprehend the Trinity and unity than a nutshell can hold all the water in the sea. Well put, Thomas. Now there's all sorts of fancy things that people come up with to try and explain the Trinity. There is nothing to explain it other than what God reveals to us in his word. And we're coming to behold our God, one God in three persons who's revealed. And this for the Jews was the reason why the Jews picked up stones to stone Jesus whenever he said something that put him on equal level with God. You being a man, claim to be God. You deserve to die. How dare you? Here's the glory of Christ's deity, his being God, revealed on the mountain. Might have been Mount Hermon, which is a high mountain. Also a significant mountain in that region because in the Canaanite pagan uh, worship of Baal, uh, the god Baal and so on, they believed he used to live up um, Mount Hermon. If it was Mount Hermon, it doesn't tell us it was, but if it was that, it's a high mountain. Notice how often people have to go up mountains uh, in the Bible. But Jesus takes the disciples up the mountain. What does it say he goes up the mountain for? That's what Jesus often goes up the mountain for, is for prayer. How many of us climb a mountain for prayer? Most of us go up for the view, don't we? Yeah? Peter, James, and John, what a view they had. They weren't necessarily looking out over the plains of northern Israel from Mount Hermon. They were climbing right up into this place, which was supposedly a bastion of pagan idol worship. And here God was going to show himself to them. And they wouldn't fully understand it yet. But what they've recorded for us in the New Testament helps us to really trust and believe that what they saw was God the Son, Jesus, shining out on that mountain. His face shone like the sun. In all of its brightness, you can't look at the sun, can you? His clothes became white as light. One of the other uh, gospel writers says his clothes became whiter than anybody could launder them using whatever fancy materials, but just Jesus just was shining. The word transfigured in Greek is metamorpho, from which we get the word metamorphosis, yeah? You know that, where you get a creature that goes into a little cocoon, a wriggly little uh, caterpillar thing, and out it comes with wings, and you're like, whoa, how did that happen? That's the sort of thing that happens here. Peter and James and John are just astounded at what they see. But not only that, do they see the glory of Jesus, but Elijah and Moses turn up, and they know that they're Elijah and Moses. Now, those guys were long dead, but here they are alive on the mountain talking with Jesus. Interesting. What are they talking to Jesus about? Luke tells us they were ta talking about his exodus. Jesus was going to go out of this world, but he was going to go out like the people of Israel went out in their exodus. He was going to go out in victory. Peter and James and John, they didn't understand it then, but they would come to understand it on resurrection day. Luke tells us that the disciples had actually fallen asleep. Now, you find the disciples doing that quite often. Hands up if when you pray, you fall asleep. Okay, I, happened to, I didn't want you really to put your hands up, but that happens. But they've climbed the high mountain, so they're a wee bit tired out, yeah? And they're enjoying this time with Jesus, and Jesus is committed in prayer, as always he seems to be when he climbs his mountains. And the disciples fall asleep. And when they come to, Jesus is glowing. 
It says that when he was praying, in Luke's account, when he was praying, he was transfigured. So when he's talking with his Father God in that moment, this was the time for his glory to shine out. After what Peter had said the week before, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. God decides, we're going to show you more than you can take in at this moment. And the glory and the radiance of God shines out of Jesus. God the Son, who had eternally existed, who had become a man, walking here on this earth, so that God's purposes of love and grace toward us, broken, ruined sinners, headed for a lost eternity away from God, we might be brought back to him. This is why he's here, and his glory shines out. The writer of Hebrews starts off um, what we have in the book of Hebrews, and he says the sun is the radiance of his glory, the sun being God the sun, is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. So we're back to thinking about Jesus. The, the Trinity's hard, isn't it? One God and three persons. But here we have one person with two natures. It's hard too. But the New Testament writers are convinced of it. And because of it, it guarantees salvation for us. We're getting there. Stick with me. This radiance of his glory and the exact representation of God's nature is in the sun. And it was seen in the person of Jesus. Paul, when he's writing his letter to the church in Colossae, Chapter 1, verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. God made somehow visible to us human beings who cannot see the glory of the Spirit God, Creator. You know, John, at the beginning of his gospel, being one of the three, he, he really gets it. And he says, in the beginning was the Word. Speaks about his eternity, he's always been there. In the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God. So we're back to the Trinity. Here is God the Son. He's separate from God. But the next phrase says, and the word was God. So we have his eternity, we have his personality, and we have his deity, God the Son. And yet he comes and he takes on human flesh. And that's what we're going to be focused on over these coming days at YFR. The man who is God. Paul went on in Colossians, and chapter 2, verse 9, said of Jesus Christ, in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Guys, we, we cannot get our heads around this one. We have to accept it by faith, that God came as a man to be our saviour. John went on in John chapter 1, verse 14, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we saw his glory. There's John probably thinking back to the mountain experience when Jesus shone before them, but also everything else that he saw in his life when he put it all together on resurrection day. We saw his glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Jesus himself said to his followers when he was gathered with them the night before he went to the cross, he said, the one who has seen me has seen the father. I remember this from last time the flies the one who has seen me has seen the father in looking at Jesus we see God and we see the heart of God the one who has come to save us from the mess that we cannot get ourselves out of the truth of God the son becoming a man means that Christ became what he had previously not been a human without ever ceasing to be God. We need to hold on to this. That Jesus was truly God and truly man. Two natures coexisting in perfect unity in one person. Just like the Trinity is beyond our capacity, so this is beyond our capacity. So we ask God for the faith to believe it because it means so much. Bruce Milne writes this. I'm going to read this quote to you. Jesus is one divine human person in two natures, i.e. with two sets of capacities for experience, expression, reaction, and action. And the two natures are united in his personal being without mixture, confusion, separation, or division. And that each nature retained its own attributes. In other words, all the qualities that are in us, as well as all the qualities and powers in God, 
were, are, and ever will be really and distinguishingly present in one person, the man of Galilee. Wonderful truth. Paul wrote to Timothy, 1 Timothy 3.16, beyond question, great is the mystery of godliness, he who was revealed in the flesh. My favorite Christmas carol, <clears throat> Heart the Herald Angels Sing. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb, veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel. Guys, I'm laboring this point because I have a concern for us at YFR. I'm not, I'm not picking at anything here, and I, I don't know what's going to happen and what's going to be said. But let's just be careful with this, that we don't make too much of Christ's deity at, expe at the expense of his humanity, and neither make too much of his humanity at the expense of his deity. Here's a quote from Jim Packer that's very helpful. The Son of God lived his divine human life in and through his human mind and body at every point. The idea that Jesus' two natures were like alternating electrical circuits so that sometimes he acted in his humanity and sometimes in his divinity is mistaken. I confess, I've been there. But in my study for this, I've been absolutely convinced that was wrong. He did and endured everything, including his sufferings on the cross. In the unity of his divine human person, i.e. as the Son of God, who had taken to himself all human powers of acting, reacting, and experience in their own fallen form. This is who Jesus is. God and man. Truly God. Truly man. Fully God. Fully man. At all times. It was a terrifying experience on the mountain. Let's get back to Matthew 17. And we'll wrap this up. Moses and Elijah are there. Peter comes to his senses out of his sleepiness and says something a bit stupid. <clears throat> Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles, one for each of you. It's nothing like a good site for a pilgrimage. That's uh, what people like. So many people in this world like a place to go to, a religious pilgrimage. This bright cloud overshadows them. And all of a sudden, they are absolutely terrified. That's the language that's here. Because the voice comes from the glory, the majestic glory, as Peter described it in 2 Peter chapter 1. This is my son, a chosen one. You listen to him. Yes, you've listened to Moses, Peter, James, and John, and you've done a good job listening to him. You've listened to the prophets. Elijah's one of those great prophets. You've listened to them, yes. But now, God the Son is here. You don't know it yet, but on resurrection day, it'll all fit together for you. You listen to him from now on. Notice that we're told in verse 6 of Matthew 17 that they fell down on their faces, absolutely terrified. Quite often, we read in the Bibles that Jesus will come down, sorry, God will come down. And there's a cloud that accompanies his presence, and it's a fearful thing. And here you have Jesus who has been shining out in a way that's never seen in a human being. And there's this bright cloud that would signify the presence of God in that moment. And a voice that's heard from heaven. And the men were terrified. We repeatedly read this in the scriptures. That when people come face to face with God in some way and to some degree, there is terror. Shepherds on the hillside. Isaiah. Isaiah 6, Ezekiel when he has the visions of God, John later on when he receives the revelation from Jesus Christ, falls on his face like a dead man. When we're beholding God over these coming days, let's do it with reverence. Let's be careful that the Jesus that you believe in is not some domesticated Jesus of our own limitations and mind but rather we give him everything that we see in scripture and we give him all respect and honor in the terror jesus said 
You've no need to be afraid. This is our God who comes to us. He's the God we cannot approach in our sinfulness, but yet he comes to us and he reaches out to us and he says, don't be afraid. I've come to do something wonderful to bring you to myself. We sing a hymn in the remembrance quite often. We laud the everlasting word, the Father's only Son. God manifestly seen and heard and heaven's beloved one. Worthy the name of Jesus now that every knee therein should bow. This is my son. I'm with him. I'm well pleased. I want to wrap it up with this. Why stress Jesus, the God man, so much? You've done well sticking with me. Why stress it so much? Because Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 9 that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. If Jesus Christ is not truly God and not truly man, two natures in one person, then we have no salvation. But because he is that, God is able to reconcile us to himself. Fallen sinners are able to come and be part of the family of God now and for eternity. And because God in Christ, in Christ, is able to reconcile. Paul says in his letter to Timothy, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Why must he be God and man? You'll be pleased to hear, I, I looked up the Heidelberg Catechism. I'm not showing off. I did a bit of research because I needed words to get this because my words just go on and on and on. And you think, yeah, they do. We're finished in a moment. The Heidelberg Catechism, which is where you would be asked a question and you would learn a response, a way of learning the things of Scripture and the truths about God and the things that are absolutely fundamental for life. Question 16, why must the mediator be a true and righteous man? You would all respond. Because God's justice requires that human nature, which has sinned, must pay for its sin. But a sinner could never pay for others. That's good. Question 17. Why must the mediator be God, be true God? You would answer, because you've learned the answer. So that, by the power of his divinity, he might bear in his humanity the weight of God's wrath and earn for us and restore to us righteousness and life. Do you see why this is so important? He must be a perfect man so that he would pay for my sin and for your sin on the cross. This one who shone on the mountaintop would die in the darkness of Calvary because he took my sin. But because he was and is the eternal God, he was the only one who was able to bear the weight of the wrath of God against my sin in all of its infinity. No ordinary man could bear that. It must be God there too. Paul in Philippians chapter 2. Christ Jesus, who as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself. Now that doesn't mean surrendering divine power and attribute. It means surrendering divine glory and dignity. He emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. And for this reason, God also highly exalted him. This is our savior. Behold, your God. It was the father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace by the blood of his cross. Jesus, the God man shone on that mountain and he shines in the glory of heaven now. And when we see him face to face, it's going to be absolutely glorious. I imagine we're going to say, Jesus, I'm so sorry for what I got wrong. So here and now, please, as we study him over these coming days, let's ask God to peel back and remove whatever distractions that are there, whatever blind spots are there, and let's see Jesus for who he really is. It took the resurrection to make it all fall into place. Thomas wasn't there on resurrection night with the others. He was there a week later and Jesus came back for him. And he says, Thomas, come and see and put your hands into the marks. 
Thomas as his known heat lord. My lord and my God. He gets down and he worships. The one who he's come to know is the Christ. But it's the Christ who is God. Matthew 17 verse 8. Raising their eyes they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. Make him the sole vision. Sole focus this week in all of the discussions that we would have together in the formal sessions. But also, let's make that effort to talk of him and to share with one another all that we know of him. Jesus, the man who is God.